Well, good day, everyone. Welcome to a huge week in our chronological Bible reading plan. Huge for two reasons. Number one, we're officially halfway through. All right, we're up to week number 25 as we endeavor to read through the Bible in a year. But it's not only big in regards to our progress, it's also a huge week in regards to our chronology. This week, we see something significant that takes place that literally affects the whole rest of the biblical narrative. And so uh, what we're reading this week is super duper. Super important. Effectively, there are three aspects to our readings this week. The first thing we're going to do is finish off the book of Proverbs, the last seven chapters. I won't say anything about that because I commented on that a couple of weeks ago at length. We're going to read through the book of Ecclesiastes. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then, of course, we're reading some narrative with Kings and Chronicles. And that, in the narrative, is where some major events take place where the kingdom of Israel splits into two after Solomon's death. And again, as I said, that is a massive, massive thing to take place. All right, so let's first of all have a look at the book of Ecclesiastes, all right? Ecclesiastes is in our readings this week because it is often attributed to King Solomon, although it's highly unlikely he actually wrote it, or at least wrote all of it, all right? Uh, if you read the introduction and the conclusion, it's written in the third person. And even when the author is speaking, he, he says it himself, I think it's in chapter one, he says, I was king of Israel and these things happened. So we, can't, we know that Solomon can't say that because his kingdom finished when he died. So he can't be writing this from his grave saying, I was the king of Israel. All right. So it's quite possible that what this is, is a fictional autobiography, all right? Essentially, that's where someone, an autonomous writer, takes on the persona of Solomon and writes from his perspective. Not really Solomon, but writes from King Solomon's perspective, as it were, pretending to be him. So that's why he can say, I, when I was the king of Israel. Okay, so that's one of, the, one of the theories. But either way, certainly, as I said, the prologue and the epilogue, the beginning and the end are written in the third person. But what we see in between is effectively this King Solomon character talking to himself on musings on life, or possibly talking to a, a, an anonymous audience uh, about a whole bunch of rantings and ramblings um, that really sound like uh, the like the ramblings, basically, of an old man. So basically, this is how I see it, all right? Uh, King Solomon is attributed with three very different books. Song of Solomons, which we read a couple of weeks ago, that is Solomon writing uh, to his wife as a lover. The book of Proverbs, which is Solomon uh, as a father writing wisdom to his sons. If that be the case, then Ecclesiastes, as I see it, is Solomon, an old man, talking to his mates in the pub ranting, raving, and ramblings of an old man on life as he has experienced it, where he is well beyond ideology. And basically, you know, it reminds me, as I read Ecclesiastes this week, of the old saying that says, there are two things guaranteed in life. Number one, death, you're going to die. And number two, taxes, all right? You are going to pay taxes. I'm sure you've heard that saying before. Well, in Ecclesiastes, the summary of the book basically is this. There's three things guaranteed in life. You're going to get old, you're going to die, and basically stuff happens in life, okay? Random stuff will happen to you. And essentially, it is the, um, it is the writings of a philosopher um, that, that knows that there is no great ideology that makes everything in life make sense. And so that's how I kind of picture it as a man, uh, an old man chatting with his mates, just rambling on about his experiences in life. I hope that's not demeaning of the book, but basically if you're in a melancholic mood, okay, Ecclesiastes is the book for you. Uh, there are some nuggets of great truth in there, as there is whenever you talk to an old man. He'll come out with some great nuggets of truth, uh, but it's interspersed uh, with a whole bunch of melancholy and, uh, you know, other, other sort of ramblings, really. So uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy Ecclesiastes. What I do insist this week is that you sit down and read it through in one sitting. And if you want to do more research about it as to who the author might be, as to why it's included in our Bible in the first place, because there has been debate about that in the past, then I'll leave that to you to Google. But please read through Ecclesiastes. It'll take you about 20 to 30 minutes. All right. Read it through in one sitting. All right, so that's that. Now we get to the big event of the week, the narrative. First Kings 10 to 14 and 2 Chronicles 9 to 12. We have an epic, epic, epic thing take place this week where Solomon, the great and powerful Solomon, disobeys God, 
is rebuked by a prophet, and then he dies and his kingdom is split. Those three things. He disobeys God, is rebuked by a prophet, and he dies and his kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, is split into two. Let's look at those three things uh, as they take place. First of all, we see this this week, Solomon, the great, powerful and wealthy man, disobeys the very three things that Moses warned about in Deuteronomy 17, hundreds of years earlier. When you go back and read Deuteronomy 17, before Moses died, he said, when you ask for a king, Israel, make sure he doesn't acquire a great number of horses and particularly horses from Egypt. Well, we find that this week, Solomon does exactly that. Moses said, make sure that this man, this king that you have, doesn't give himself a Acquire a great number of wives, or else those women will lead his heart his heart astray into idolatry, like Eve did with Adam. Well, that's exactly what we find out happens with King Solomon. And the other thing Moses said was, make sure that this king does not acquire huge amounts of gold and silver. And yet again, that is exactly what we see Solomon doing. So three strikes, Solomon is out. He has disobeyed what Moses prophesied way back in Deuteronomy 17. So what happens? Well, the second thing that we see this week is that he is confronted by a prophet called Ahijah. Now, this is really interesting because what we start to see happen or what we see happen here is the ministry of the prophets like prosecuting attorneys. All right, listen, Moses penned the law. He was the law giver. The prophets come to God's people and to God's kings especially, and they prosecute that law. They act like a lawyer that has God's kings up in the dock and says, this is how you've disobeyed the law, and therefore this is the consequence that's going to come to you. Remember, that is one of the major roles of the Old Testament prophets. They are like prosecuting attorneys for the Old Covenant. Well, that's what Ahijah does. He comes to Solomon. He says, because you've disobeyed in these areas, you've gone to worship other gods because of your many wives, God is going to take Take the kingdom away from you. King Solomon, David's son, God is going to take the kingdom away from you. He gets a cloak, he tears it into 12 pieces, and he uh, he gives it to another man called Jeroboam. And he says, Jeroboam, you are going to take 10 of the tribes, while Solomon and David's house will only retain two of them, all right? And it even says there in Kings that what God does is he raises up two other adversaries against Solomon. The word there for adversary is Satan, okay? He raises up two Satans to attack Solomon just before his death. And this is God's way of saying, listen, mate, you can't get away with disobeying me. And uh, basically, I'm splitting the kingdom from you after you die. This is a major, major event and a confrontation by the prophet. So the first thing we see is Solomon disobeys. The second thing we see is that he is confronted by this prophet uh, and uh, who appoints another king called Jeroboam, or who prophesies, sorry, another king called Jeroboam. And the third thing that we see happen is that that takes place. Literally, Solomon dies and the kingdom is split into two. Now, this takes place, no coincidence, at a place called Shechem. Okay, Shechem is when Joshua came into the promised land. And remember, they had two mountains where they pronounced blessings and curses to one another. That's where Shechem is. It's on the mountain of, uh, at the foot of the mountain of curses, where God, when Mo, Joshua said, as soon as they came into the promised land, if you disobey, God will curse you. That is where the kingdom split happens. It's where Joshua, when he died, gather all of Israel together to say, don't forget, when you disobey, God will curse you and the kingdom will be destroyed if you disobey. It is at Shechem where the split of the kingdom takes place this week. And what we see is a splitting of the 13 tribes. Remember, while we often talk about the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, officially Israel is 13 tribes because of the Levites who are priests. So what we see happen is Judah, and Benjamin, Judah is where David and Solomon are from, Judah and Benjamin and all the priestly Levites, all the priestly Levites that are scattered around the land, they all come back to Jerusalem and Judah and live there. So we've got three tribes in the south and 10 tribes in the north. They split. They each have their own kings. Okay, so God's people are now two kingdoms, Judah in the south and Israel, the majority, now in the north, the 10 northern tribes. And we read this week that these uh, people, while these two kings, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, uh, existed side by side, there was consistent friction. My friends, listen to me. I cannot stress the importance of this week's readings enough. Here's what we've seen happen from Genesis. 
We had the age of the ancients from Adam to Abraham. We then had the age of the patriarchs, Abraham through to Joseph in Egypt. We then had the age of the judges leading from Moses all the way through to Samuel. Samuel then brings in the age of the kingdom, Saul, David, and Solomon. We have the united kingdom of Israel. That era is now over. And we're about to start a whole new age of God's, the story of God's people. It is the age of the divided kingdom. Judah in the south, David's family, basically, and Israel in the north. We must understand this split because for the whole of the rest of the book of Kings, as we read, it's going to be, it's going to say when this guy was king in Judah, this guy became king in Israel. And when this guy was this old in Israel, this guy became king in Judah. So from now on, we're going to be reading this Judah, Israel, Judah, Israel split all the way through the book of Kings. As we read the prophets uh, over the next couple of months, some of them talk to Judah, some of them talk to Israel, and we will be very confused if we do not understand that split. So it is so, so, so important. We are reaching a monumental moment halfway through our yearly reading, but a huge moment in the story of God's people where the family of Israel, who became the nation of Israel, who became the kingdom of Israel, are now becoming a divided kingdom with Judah in the south and Israel in the north. This is a massive week, and I really want you to uh, notice that as you read the narrative this week. Bless you guys, and well done for reaching it halfway. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to um, seeing you next week as we keep on with this Judah-Israel-Judah-Israel split in the kingdom. Bless you heaps, and well done. I'll see you next week. Bye.